spies. The row of alleged Russian interference is showing no sign of abating. Covert operations. Russia's military forces invade Ukraine. Rumors of dark influence. One of President Putin's critics lies dead. As the world wonders how far Russia will go, there's a clue in a shocking case from a decade ago. Its full story still untold. The murder of a British citizen on British soil, using the deadliest poison known to man. A state-sponsored killing in London by means of radioactivity is quite extraordinary. Ten years on, Alexander Litvinenko's killers are still at large. And for his family, no justice. Did the Russian state do it? I just let the evidence speak for itself. The detectives who investigated the murder have never before spoken, but now they, Litvinenko's widow, and the son he left behind, tell the inside story for the first time. It's not only about investigation of crime. It's a right story how to be human. It's a story that reads like a Cold War crime thriller, but is darker than any fiction. This order can be given by only one person, President of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin. sitting in my office on the 15th floor of Scotland Yard when an officer came in and the story he told was quite extraordinary. There was a man lying in a hospital bed in North London who was claiming that uh, he was a, a former KGB officer uh, and that he, he had been poisoned. The patient, who'd given his name as Edwin Carter, had been admitted two weeks earlier it was explained to us that Edwin Carter was uh, seriously ill. They didn't know what was wrong with him. The patient had ulcers in his throat and he could not eat or drink. He believed he'd been poisoned with the heavy metal, thallium. It was consistent with some of his signs and symptoms. So for example, he'd lost his hair his blood count had dropped. He was very anxious and seemed very preoccupied in trying to make the point that something illegal had been done. I asked whether they could guarantee that Carter would survive until the following morning. And in the absence of them being able to give us that guarantee, I decided that we should start getting his account. Just after midnight, the police started recording his interview. He began with an astonishing claim. My name is Edwin Carter. I am a British citizen. I have, in Russian, I have a name, Alexander Litvinenko. I am former KGB FSB officer. My rank, Lieutenant Colonel. My position, Deputy Head of Section top secret department of FSB. Of course, at that time, we had no way of knowing uh, whether what Edwin Carter was saying was true. Can I ask you to tell us what you think has happened to you? I have no doubt that they poisoned me. All that is remained for me is to prove this with a medical examination. If you can imagine someone who's quite ill potentially hallucinating, and then starts to tell people and unravel his story that he's not really Edwin Carter. He's actually a former KGB colonel, and he's been poisoned by Vladimir Putin's orders. You can understand that people might have met that suggestion with some disbelief. But Carter did offer the police one concrete lead. The number of a contact he claimed to have had regular meetings with at a London bookshop. On 31st October at about 4 p.m. I had a meeting arranged with a person about whom I really wouldn't like to talk here. 
because I have some commitments. You can contact the person on that long telephone number. When the police called the number, a man known only as Martin came to the hospital. Martin, an MI6 officer, confirmed the patient was Alexander or Sasha Litvinenko, a former KGB agent now advising MI6 on Russian organized crime. Scotland Yard realized this would be no ordinary investigation. Let's try and understand why he's ill. Let's try and get a story from him. He was still able to talk. Was it a criminal mystery or a medical mystery? Find out which camp it fell into. If it was medical mystery, nothing to do with us, criminal, we were going to be busy. I was born in the Soviet Union in Voronezh. I grew up in North Caucasus, it's near Chechnya. After school, I've been recruited to Soviet Union Army. In 1987, I sent to KGB. For 11 years, I've been officer of KGB. I met Sasha in 1993. Very funny, very easy talking, um, very young looking, very handsome and very strong. He worked under investigation of very serious cr crime, but in sight of Russia. After 10 years service, Litvinenko was promoted to a highly classified unit. 1997, I sent to top secret department of KGB. My department has duty killing political and high businessman person without judge verdict. And the last things what he was asked to do, to kill Boris Berezovsky. An advisor to Boris Yeltsin, Berezovsky had masterminded his re-election in 1996. Litvinenko claimed he worked for a secret murder squad tasked with Berezovsky's assassination. After I had this order, I said to my boss, I, I refused. After this, KGB opened operation case against me and oppressed me. I love Sasha for feeling not to stand if he thinks something not right. In 1998, President Yeltsin appointed Vladimir Putin as the director of the KGB, now renamed the FSB. Litvinenko raised his concerns about the abuse of power with his new boss. Sasha said, I'm going to see new director Vladimir Putin. He said, what are you going to say? I will tell him everything what I know about corruption. I have meeting with Putin face to face. What Sasha mentioned immediately was very soft handshake. I bring to Putin material about criminal inside FSB. Putin took obviously opposite side. Later that year, Litvinenko and a handful of colleagues took the extraordinary step of blowing the whistle on state corruption at a press conference in Moscow. Organs of FSB started to use separate personal and не в конституционных целях безопасности государства личности, а в своих частных политических и меркантильных целях. When I asked Sasha what might happen with us after this press conference, he said, Marina, we have two ways. One way they will kill me, and another way they will arrest me. Litvinenko was arrested and spent over a year in jail. In 2000, he was released and fled the country. I must escape from Russia. We sit in an aeroplane, went to London. So it's safe, my wife and son. Ask political asylum. Despite being in great pain, he continued to answer police questions for more than nine hours, over three days and nights. He never ever asked for rest. He just said, just please, we need to work. There was a clock ticking on, on, on poor old Alexander Lipping, his life. 
the idea was for investigators to talk to him in as much detail in the short time he had left to elicit everything he knew because you weren't going to get a second chance to take a witness statement from him. Up to now, only a handful of people had seen Alexander Litvinenko in hospital. His wife, Marina, released a photo to show the world the impact of the poisoning. I remember Sasha didn't like to look like that. But in this moment, Sasha said, take this photo and I want people will see what they might do against people. Photographs showing his dramatic decline in health were released this evening. As Scotland Yard said, its counter-terrorism unit was now leading an intensive investigation. There's an iconic picture of Sasha, as I call him. It carries quite a lot of emotion for me, and it did for the team at the time. What it doesn't capture is it doesn't capture the incredible suffering that he was in. It doesn't capture the fact his throat was all <clears throat> blistered and um, you know, he couldn't swallow, he could hardly talk. He was in diabolical pain. Litvinenko knew that the heavy metal thallium was a poison of choice for the KGB. When he was diagnosed with poison, now it was like a knowledge. We know what happened to him. Before that, he became worse, but nobody can explain why. The problem was that though it appeared Litvinenko had been poisoned, no one could say exactly what with. We were pretty confident that it was not going to be thallium. You know, that left us with nothing because all of the other heavy metals that we'd looked for, which are commonly used as poisons, uh, the screen for those was also negative. With no medical explanation for Litvinenko's decline, the police sought other ways to move the investigation forward. Post-mortem is one of the most valuable tools in informing murder inquiries. <clears throat> and Sasha was obviously living. And so I wanted to do the equivalent of a living post-mortem on Sasha. Do everything we can, as if he'd died, to try and find out have we got any puncture wounds, look at all his samples, look at everything, examine him head to toe, see if we can find you know, that trigger, that reason that's led to his illness. Could a chemotherapy drug have been given to him? Could another heavy metal have been um, uh, a culprit? And then the idea of some radioactive substance was discussed. One of our experts said, well, in, um, in the Sasser's urine, uh, we found a tiny spike of polonium, but it's probably an anomaly in the plastic container. So I'm sitting there and um, Obviously, we've all grown up watching James Bond. <laughs> we all know plutonium, we all know uranium. So, I say, polonium? Don't you mean plutonium? And so, <laughs> this fella very, very tolerantly says, no, Clive, I mean polonium 210. What's polonium 210? Oh, it's the most toxic substance known to man. Okay, how do, how do we find out? A litre of Litvinenko's urine was sent to the High Security Atomic Weapons Establishment at Aldermaston. But the tests would take almost 24 hours to complete. Meanwhile, Litvinenko's life was slipping away. For me, it was not end yet. It's still enough power to fight for his life. He smiled to me and said, Marina, I love you very much. But this time when he said it, it was just so painful because it looks like he said goodbye. Litvinenko had been fighting the poison for over 21 days and now he was sliding in and out of consciousness. 
the pumping function of his heart deteriorated uh, until on the, the night of the 22nd, um, he suddenly collapsed and um, went into cardiac arrest. The crush bell went. When I first arrived, somebody had already started um, resuscitation. So there's about probably six of us in the room. Time goes very slowly during a cardiac arrest. He had uh, about 30 minutes of resuscitation. When we get a patient back, it's, uh, it's a good moment. So you've done something right for the patient. At 3 p.m., experts from the Atomic Weapons Establishment called Scotland Yard with the results of Litvinenko's urine tests. It was a phone call, and it's 10 years ago now, but I can, I can remember it. I can remember it like that. It's polonium. It's a million times a lethal dose. He's dead. No, he's, 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 not, he's not dead. He's, he's very poorly, but he's still alive. No Clive, he's dead. Nine o'clock on the evening of the 23rd, he suffered a further cardiac arrest. We're sorry to announce that Alexander Litvinenko died at University College Hospital at 9.21 on the 23rd of November 2006. I remember it was quite a young doctor who came to us and said, unfortunately we tried everything but your husband just passed away. I said, can I see him? They said, yes, of course. You can see him. And when we came to his room, Anatoly was with me. Emran told me my father would uh, get better, he would recover. And then, quite honestly, to me personally, when he actually died on the 23rd, it came to me as a massive shock because I kept, I, until, the light, until the final few days, I kept thinking that he was going to recover. I still remember him in a different way. He was very handsome. But more important thing, I could hug him in the last time, I could kiss him, and I could feel his smell. We now know the former Russian spy was poisoned by radioactive polonium, and that is a first in the United Kingdom. I'd never heard of polonium-210. I know nothing about radioactivity or about radioactive isotopes. Uh, but it was absolutely clear that this was something completely out of the, the ordinary and it just changed the whole nature of what we were dealing with. Polonium is extremely rare. 5,000 times more radioactive than radium. And when swallowed, just one millionth of a gram is enough to kill. For Scotland Yard, the intensive care unit was now a crime scene. It was sealed off with Litvinenko's body to protect both evidence and staff. Where the murder victim in the body is, is always a crime scene. However, they were contaminated polonium. Oh, no one knew what to do. We didn't know how safe it was. What we have now is a murder inquiry, plain and simple. You've got to stick to the facts. Now, in this case, what that transpired as being was following the polonium trail around London. The places he visited are now being searched, and Three radioactivity have now been referred to a specialist. Traces clinic. of the substance that's believed the to have killed. The risk to the public is very low. I remember coming out of a Cobra meeting, and there was a whole 
horde of photographers and reporters outside on the pavement. And uh, I remember a voice shouting at me, Mr. Clark, are the public safe? And I remember thinking to myself, I haven't got a clue. I don't know. The polonium that killed Litvinenko is very difficult to manufacture. This is something that is made in a reactor and therefore you have to have access to the products of a reactor. And the place where um, that is made in Russia is a very high security um, operation indeed. So it was perfectly clear. I mean, it, that was a real marker of who might be involved. Death of a person is always a tragedy. However, as far as I know, in the medical conclusion of British doctors, there is no warning that this is a suicide death. Scotland Yard now had to work out how the polonium had been brought into the UK and identify the assassin. The clues were to be found in the extraordinary interview Litvinenko had recorded just before his death. I have no doubt who wanted this. This was done by Russian secret service. Because I have knowledge of this system, I know that to kill a citizen of another country this order can be given by only one person. This person is President of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin. The focus for me was to look to see who'd had the opportunity to poison him. I was surprised at the presence of mind he had as he was working through the possibilities of the various people that he'd met on the 1st of November. He was working through it very much with a detective's mind. Litvinenko told police that the day he fell ill, he met with an Italian intelligence analyst. Mario Scaramella called to my home phone. Mario said to me, Alexander, please, meet him. Scaramella had sought Litvinenko's advice for an Italian parliamentary inquiry into allegations that the KGB had tried to influence the Italian government. I say, Sasha, please don't eat because we're going to have this special dinner. It's the 1st of November. It's already six years since we came to UK and the first time when we're a British citizen. I arrived to Piccadilly Circus. I find Mario in the square. Mario asked me to go eating first. A restaurant, Itsu, opposite Bond Street. He suggests that we should sit somewhere quiet, have something to eat and talk. He is very, very nervous. He starts to talking very fast. Sasha couldn't really understand why the meeting was really important, why he'd been called there, and it flipped his suspicion radar. Scotland Yard sent an investigation team to Itsu Restaurant. How do you search for Polonia? Well, you actually search for it with something a bit like a dirt devil hoover because polonium, whilst it's radioactive and it's dangerous, it emits alpha waves. And they only go, they only go about that far. And so to detect them, you have to be that close to them. Soon after they got in there, I remember getting a phone call, we got a positive indication of alpha radiation. It's a restaurant, could be a murder venue. He could treat it as a glamour Cluedo. Now it's not belittling the approach to it, but Cluedo, you have a room, you have a killer, you have a weapon. And when you get those things in your envelope, you generally solved it. Mario Scaramella became a person of interest. 
If you're exposed to it, what happens is, is that you secrete it, and you secrete it through sweat. And you can't control that secretion, so when you secrete it through sweat, in fact, we can, when you touch something, you pick something up, you touch something, we can actually map where you've been. Scaramella had stayed at the Thistle Hotel in Victoria. Very quickly we established that the hotel that he stayed in wasn't contaminated and um, Mr Scaramella wasn't contaminated at all. And so what were the chances of him being involved? They were fairly, they were fairly remote. Well, why is it so restaurant contaminated? The analysis when it was done goes to show that where Scaramella had been sitting with Litvinenko when they had lunch on November the 1st. That wasn't where the contamination was found. It turned out that, that actually it was at a different table to the one which Scaramello and Litvinenko had sat at on the 1st of November. You could have taken a view that in the clued envelope, Itsu restaurant was the venue, Polonium was the murder weapon. Thank you very much, have a lovely day. And then suddenly, the envelope is ripped up and thrown away. Police needed to explain the traces of polonium on the second table at Itsu. The clues again lay in Litvinenko's police interview. He had another meeting the day he fell ill. After the restaurant, where did you go? I go to Millennium Hotel. On this day, I have a meeting planned with two Russian people. The first person, Andrei Lugavoy. He is a former KGB officer. He had been bodyguard of Prime Minister of Russia. The second man, Kaftun. He has been Soviet Army officer. Maybe second lieutenant, maybe captain. When Sasha was in hospital, and when we talk, about his suspicious he might be poisoned. And I said, but who, who could do this? And he mentioned this meeting with Lugovo and Kofton in Millennium Hotel. He has come from the bar and say, Sasha, I am here. He says that he must leave for a football match. So we will talk for 10, 15 minutes and no more. On the table there is a few cups and also a teapot. I pour some tea from the pot. For some reason I didn't like it. Uh, it it's almost cold tea. I drink maybe three or four times. And after you drank from the pot, did Andrei or Kofton drink anything from that pot? No, for sure. The ingestion, eating something was important. So there was huge scrutiny on this, and if it was polonium, it would be definitive. In the end, he looked at his watch. He say, my wife is about to come, and he bring his son. And he said, this is Uncle Sasha. We shake hands, and he go. Police turned their attention to the hotel in Mayfair where the two suspects stayed. Lugovoy and Kofton were captured on CCTV going upstairs to the gents' toilets. Traces of polonium were found that matched their movements. So we'll go with the hypothesis that Mr Lugovoy and Mr Kofton, they had more than something to do with it. On the 16th of October, Mr. Lugovoy and Mr. Kovdan both came into the country on a BA flight from Moscow. They went and stayed in the best Western Shastri Avenue. Polonium was found in that room in the bathroom. Then police made their second breakthrough. They discovered Litvinenko had an earlier meeting with Lugovoy and Kovdan two weeks before their afternoon tea at the Millennium. 
The location? Itsu Sushi Bar. The table where they'd sat was the one on which police had already detected traces of polonium. Got contamination. Because it's not secondary contamination, it was primary contamination, as in something bad had happened there. You tried to whack him in it to a restaurant. You tried. So he had been attacked on the 16th. In fact, he'd have died as a result of the attack on the 16th. It was that significant, but he was that robust that it didn't work as quickly as it should have done. After the Itsu attack, Lugoboy and Kofton travelled back to Moscow on a Trans-Zero aircraft. We managed to stop that at Heathrow Airport. That was emotional because they didn't react all that well to that plane being stopped. The aircraft was checked. They did find traces of Planium 210. In retaliation for interfering with the Transaero flight, the Russian authorities had placed the tugs that pushed the aircraft back from the stands in front of a British Airways jet at Moscow Airport. So it was this kind of tit for tat that started to underpin some of the political dimensions on this investigation. I think it turned out that. 36,000 people have been on planes that could have been contaminated. Traces of radiation found at 12 different locations, including two British Airways planes, in an investigation stretching right across Europe in pursuit of a radioactive trail. The number of scenes that were unravelling on a day-by-day -day basis went to about 40-odd scenes. And this had been everything from the hotels that the two key suspects had stayed in, to places where they'd had meetings together. Litvinenko appeared to have survived the Itsu attack on the 16th of October. Lugovoy returned to London alone nine days later. Detectives believe he flew in armed to kill. They found evidence in the Sheraton Park Lane Hotel. We came up with this random way of describing how safe or not something could be, and um, we called it the runaway factor. Their detection devices, quote, were minging, um, unquote. I think that meant there was a huge amount of radiation in that room. They'd had to withdraw from the room fairly quickly. Extremely high levels of radiation in the bathroom sink and pipes led police to believe Lugovoy had poured the polonium down the drain. It was the most nuclear scene that has, um, I think, has, it, has it ever been found in civilian circumstances. And the runaway factor there was Usain Bolt-esque. Litvinenko had ultimately died as a result of the attack in the Millennium Hotel. But this may have been the last of three attempts by Lugovoy and Kofton to kill him. Police were desperate to prove conclusively that Litvinenko had died from polonium poisoning. Eight days after his death, Britain's top pathologist finally examined the body. The autopsy was a difficult, dangerous procedure. Levels of polonium that were eventually found from the tissues were a hundredfold higher than would be compatible with life. When he opened up, all he could see is atrophy of tissue. It's essentially sort of just dissolved in a slurry, as it were. And so it was clear what had been going on. The autopsy confirmed Litvinenko's death was a direct result of his ingesting deadly polonium. From fairly early on in the inquiry, Andrei Lugovoy and Dmitry Kofton became people of interest. Uh, and so that is why 
We wanted to interview them as soon as possible and that meant sending a team of officers to Moscow to do just that. The conversation with Peter led to the section of Brian Tarpey. The formal setting for the request tops. Do you fancy going to Russia? I think it was in the toilets on the 15th floor. In walked my boss. I said, hello, Clive, um, as you would. And uh, his immediate response was, ah, oh, tops, my best man. Uh, what are you doing for the next couple of weeks? So obviously the natural environment for a, a challenge to be set like that. DI Brian Tarpey's team had been briefed by MI6 about what to expect in Moscow. The thought of um, having to lead a team in Moscow was at first quite daunting. There was the obvious warnings about potential honey traps. Our rooms might be bugged or searched. I had left, shall we say, certain traps which would indicate to me that uh, my drawers had been moved or searched. The team's first meeting was with the Russian general prosecutor. We were welcomed by the deputy ambassador and the general prosecutor. I think there were eight objectives, eight things that we wished to achieve while we were there. The top two of those would be to interview Lugovoy and Kofton. It's then that the conversation became a little more difficult. We believed them to be in a place called Nuclear Hospital Number 6. He was asking, what is this Nuclear Hospital Number 6? I've never heard of it. This means nothing to me. You know, we don't know where they are. We have got no idea where they are. How do you know? Nuclear Hospital Number 6 was a clinic built to treat the victims of the Chernobyl disaster. About five o'clock, we received a phone call stating, surprisingly, he was in hospital number six, and this place did exist. In less than 10 minutes, we were in the van. The journey there was quite interesting. They drove very quickly to start with. They didn't seem to know where they were going themselves and we had to, on, on at least two occasions, do U-turns to get back out of the area where we were. Whether this was to delay us getting to the hospital or not, uh, I, I don't know. After two hours driving, they arrived at the hospital just before 9 p.m. The next point of contention, we were told under no circumstances would we be allowed to bring any recording devices with us into the hospital and the interview will conclude by 10 o'clock. Cofton was said to be receiving treatment for exposure to polonium. Only one Scotland Yard officer was permitted to enter the room. It turned out to be a very strange series of events. There was a man in a bed who he was told was Dimitri Cofton. The only thing that he could see was the eyes. It could have been anyone sat in the bed. We'll never know who it was. After just 13 minutes, the doctor stopped the interview. Of the questions that we had wanted to be asked, only about half were asked before the time ran out. So it really wasn't satisfactory from my perspective. To put it simply, they were messed about. Um, the, the, the Russians kept saying, we're cooperating, but uh, it was unlike any cooperation that I've ever seen. The Scotland Yard team had been in Moscow for two days. Developments in London were about to have an impact on their investigation. Now, it was being treated as a suspicious death, but in the last half hour, Scotland Yard have confirmed that they are now treating the poisoning of Alexander Litvinenko as murder. 
the intelligence and the political and the diplomatic dimensions were all firmly intertwined. And so from a very early stage, there was going to be a certain amount of finger pointing towards Russia. Right. I was concerned about the impact of that change of status to the team in Russia. Did it pose a challenge? Most definitely. You're interviewing their nationals and you're seeing them as a witness and then suddenly you've announced it's a murder. It must have been fairly clear that actually there was a, a picture was unfolding which I fear the Russian government would not want us to explore. Because с британской стороны мы видим попытку уголовное дело и необходимость профессионального расследования использовать и для нагнетания какой-то политической кампании. Мы против этого, этим должны заниматься соответствующие правоохранительные органы. After six frustrating days of waiting, an interview with the second suspect, Andrei Lugovoy, was cancelled at short notice. The Russians also announced that Kofton's health was declining rapidly. Hours after giving evidence to investigators in Moscow today, Mr. Kofton reportedly fell into a coma and is in a critical condition from radiation poisoning. The investigation had stalled and the team encountered another unexpected problem. I remember one evening my officer was complaining of stomach cramp and not being very well. early the next morning. I was to accompany him back to the General Prosecutor's Office. We were offered tea. I had no hesitation in saying yes, I'd have a cup of tea please. So I had the cup of tea and we left. I started to feel a little uncomfortable and not wanting to put too fine a point on it. I had the shits. I have no doubt in my mind that we were probably poisoned, but something like gastroenteritis. I think that there was a deliberate ploy to weaken us physically because we were the, uh, we were the decision makers in the team. It, it didn't stop them doing what they did. It just meant they had to do it in short bursts. <laughs> The following day, Tarpi and the team were escorted back to hospital number six to interview the second suspect, Andre Lugovoy. Again, we were told that he was a sick patient in the hospital um, and the interviews would be conducted there. We were told that we could not bring any recording devices into the hospital room, so we were totally reliant on the, on the Russians recording this. The police were also told the interview would be conducted in Russian because Lugovoy spoke no English. When Lugovoy was interviewed, he looked as fit as a fiddle. He wasn't bandaged and was there in his own clothes uh, and probably had only just turned up at the hospital. I suppose I can tell you what I hoped for. I hoped for an account that could give us an opportunity to prove or disprove what they said. I thought that, well, this has been recorded, so we'll, we'll get what it is that's been said and we can compare that to the, the notes that have been taken. At the end of the interview, Lugovoy kind of smirked and said, good luck with your investigation in English. After two weeks in Moscow, the Scotland Yard detectives were ready to return home. All that remained was to collect copies of the evidence from the Russian general prosecutor. They agreed that uh, they would just film the evidence being handed to me. I was presented with a bundle of interviews and tapes. We took the evidence with us back on the flight back to London. The Scotland Yard team arrived back in London the following evening. I was very glad to be back in the UK. And I was equally glad to be able to hand over a bundle of interviews and tapes. 
The next day, Tarpey received a phone call from Scotland Yard Forensics. It was um, one of the uh, forensic management team. He was asking, was there another Lugavoy tape? And, and at first I, I, I couldn't understand what, what, he, what he meant by that. And I said, no, I've, I've given you the tapes. And I said, why? I can't remember exactly where I was when I found out from Tarps that what was probably the most important output from that whole deployment, uh, it, it never made it on the plane. The recording of Lugovoy's vital interview was missing from the evidence package handed over by the Russian authorities. I'd been outmaneuvered like a chess piece um, by the Russians. Was it an accident? No. It didn't tell me that Tarps or anyone else had been unprofessional. It told me we'd been done. One month after his death, Alexander Litvinenko's body was still so radioactive, it had to be placed in a lead-lined coffin for burial. It was not an uh, ordinary coffin, it was a sum from metal. And they said if we decide one day to take this coffin from grave, it would be allowed only after 30 years. Alexander Litvinenko was buried in Highgate Cemetery. He was 44 years old. Police believe that Lugovoy and Kofton had poisoned Litvinenko in the Millennium Hotel, Mayfair. But after being frustrated in Moscow, they still needed to build a cast iron case by proving how the polonium had been administered. This expert advice said that There'll be no trace of polonium left on anything that has been washed 42 times with a dishwasher. Don't bother doing the teapots, teacups, saucers, teaspoons, because you'll be wasting your time. But all the instincts were, yeah, go on, let's have a go. a full-scale deflection on this teapot. Full-scale deflection. So, what did that mean? It meant that there was a smoking teapot. It's not the same as a smoking gun, but it was significant. The contamination in the teapot leads, of course, inescapably to Hofton and Lugavoy. The police had the last piece of the puzzle and handed the evidence over to the Crown Prosecution Service. Five months later, the CPS formally sought the extradition of Lugavoy on a charge of murder. Our position was that if Lugavoy or Cofton left the country and went uh, to a jurisdiction where they were extraditable, we would seek to extradite them. Lugavoy and Cofton denied the allegations in the Russian media. Поэтому послушайте, обратитесь к голливудским фильмам и к вашим фильмам про Джеймса Бонда. Вы же сами там такого порой напридумываете. Ну вот и покопайтесь внутри себя, уважаемые британцы. In December 2007, Lugovoy became a member of Russia's parliament, giving him immunity from prosecution. The Home Secretary, Theresa May, ruled out a public inquiry, fearing it would damage relations with Russia. But finally, in 2014, under pressure from the High Court, she changed her mind. More than eight years after Litvinenko's death, the public inquiry opened at the High Court in London. For me, it was already like, I've done it. I'm already satisfied. 
because it was very important to bring information to public. Lugovoy and Cobton poisoned him and you will decide on all of the evidence whether or not they were sponsored by the Russian state. Some people started to say, mm, we're not sure they're going to do anything against Russia. And they said they probably will just close this case, I'm not going to do anything. Finally, Judge Sir Robert Owen delivered his verdict. I have concluded that there is a strong probability that when Mr. Lugovoy poisoned Mr. Lepnenko, he did so under the direction of the FSB. I have further concluded that the FSB operation to kill Mr. Litvinenko was probably approved by Mr. Petruchev, then head of the FSB, and also by President Putin. It was a very powerful verdict. It was named Putin, and we've been just like overwhelmed. It's a huge victory, and it's a pretty remarkable victory, considering the forces that were behind my father's murder. It doesn't mean Lugovo and Kofton, who certainly committed this crime, going to be sent to the prison. But you, even you're not in prison, but you're already punished. To wake up and go to sleep, to know people knew you are criminal, you are murderer. The investigation had been the most complex, dangerous and technically demanding ever undertaken by British law enforcement. This was the Metropolitan Police and police in the UK at its best. They gave an incredible amount, you know, which means a huge amount to me. It meant a huge amount for Marina and I couldn't be more proud of, of them. He was a real man. He was not a double agent, he was just a human. And a real man as a father, as a husband. Good luck, take care. <laughs> of course, justice hasn't been done to the fullest extent, but when you consider the situation under the circumstances under which my father was murdered, it's pretty amazing that we got any semblance of justice at all. You have this person in your heart. You can leave, but anyway, your heart has a big hole. I believe he's able to see everything what happened. And I hope he's proud of this. Marina now knows that her husband's story has been told. And if it is disputed, well then the people it applies to, they can happily bowl up here and have their day in court to explain their story. And um, that'd be a good day out.